so uh, we are moving on and we're looking at section B. In section B you have to choose one of two questions and you're going to ask to question five which is the question about coasts. Okay, so in this topic you should be thinking about coastal erosion, coastal deposition, stacks and arches, spits and how we can protect the coast, that sort of thing. So the first thing we want to do is we want to understand why coasts retreat or what is coastal retreat. Okay, so here we have our coastline. There we go. This is like a cliff and here is the sea coming in. Now the sea will erode and attack the base of the cliff, gradually eroding it away like so. And it does this through hydraulic action and through abrasion. Hydraulic action is the sheer force of the water pounding against the base of the cliff and abrasion is all the little pebbles that are in the sea which are gradually wearing away and abrading away the base of the cliff. You can clearly see what's going to happen. The base of the cliff is unsupported and will eventually collapse and so the cliff retreats. Now we know that the tide's got them down so at high tide the cliff will look like that but at low tide you see an exposed piece of rock and that is a wave cut platform. Okay, coastal retreat. Right, moving on then. We're now interested in investigating how rock type or geology shapes the coastline or influences the shape of the coastline. So if we have a starting point like this, and what we have are alternating bands of hard and soft rock. So let's imagine this is our chalk, this is our boulder clay, and then we have chalk again, chalk again up there, boulder clay. And here's the sea coming in. Okay, and we've just learned that the sea will erode the cliff. Now these rocks will erode at different rates. Chalk is more resistant to erosion, boulder clay is less resistant to erosion. So over time, the coastline will look like that. And the chalk areas will stick out as a headland, yet the boulder clay areas will erode faster because they are less resistant, forming a bay. And so we get headlands and bays. You might also here get stacks and stumps appearing, there'll be arches, etc. What do we call a coastline that is uneven? It is discordant, whereas a straight coastline like so is called a concordant coastline. So that is the influence of geology or rock type on the shape of the coastline. Okay, let's move on. So we need to look at two types of waves now. There are two types of waves. We have destructive waves and we have constructive waves. Now the clue is in the name. Destructive waves destroy the land. They will plunge onto the beach. So they're known as plunging waves. Okay, they are quite tall. They are frequent. Their back wash is stronger than the swash and therefore they erode material away. They will erode the beach away. Okay, so they will drag the material back away. They're common in winter when the weather is stronger. They destroy the land and they will form things like stacks and arches, headlands and bays, and they will also form very steep beaches. On the other hand, we have our constructive waves and to construct is to build. The clue is in the name. Here is our beach and they are much smaller and they sort of spill onto the beach. They spill onto the beach. They are quite short. They plunge and break less frequently. And what they will do is they will build up the beach because they deposit material. 
and this is because the swash is stronger than the backwash. Okay, so you have your destructive waves, your constructive waves, more uh, normal in some of your constructive waves. Okay, let's have a look at some coastal landforms that we need to be familiar with next. So we're looking at the role of destructive waves in the shaping of the coastline or the typical landforms associated with hard rock coastlines. And our typical landform is this, and you should all be able to draw this by now. So we have a wave cut notch here, we have a cave, we have an arch. Now this is chalk and I'm putting the lines on it to represent the joints and cracks. Eventually we will have a stack and a stump and here is the old roof of the arch. So what happens first? Waves will attack the coastline, they will find an area of weakness and through hydraulic action and abrasion they will form a notch, a wave cut notch. Over time that notch will grow to form a cave which will get bigger and bigger and eventually the sea will break through the headland to form an arch. Over time the roof of the arch will collapse leaving a stack which eventually is eroded and weathered away to form a stump. So try to remember your five phases and if you're struggling to write it out in words, draw a diagram and get some really good quality labels on it and you'll still get your more destructive waves and hard rock coastlines. Now boulder clay coastlines wouldn't be able to form that, they will form slumpy cliffs because when that clay gets wet it will just collapse and it will just sort of slump away like that. It can't be molded into shapes like chalk can. Let's have a look at the role of constructive waves now in shaping the coastline. And constructive waves create landforms of deposition, such as beaches and spits which is what we are going to look at. Now I know quite a few of you struggle with spits, so watch carefully at this point. So first of all, draw your coastline. It's got to have a bend in it. There's the bend. This is a river estuary, so that means when a river meets the sea. Okay, here are our waves. Notice that they are approaching the coastline at an angle in the direction of the prevailing, which means main, wind. Therefore, the waves are going to go up the beach, the swash, at an angle, but return back in a straight line. Up at an angle, return at a straight line. Up at an angle, return at a straight line. This is the zigzag motion that forms longshore drift. So this is the direction of longshore drift. At a bend in the coastline, that movement will continue and material is carried out to sea and it is deposited to form a spit. Okay, notice the shape of it, it has that sort of hook like that. In this sheltered area here, a little salt marsh will form because the water doesn't move around very much and many spits have this hooked end due to a secondary wind that sort of flicks the end around. Okay, let's just go through that again. Waves approach the coastline at an angle in the direction of the prevailing wind. Material is moved along the beach in a zigzag motion known as longshore drift. At a bend in the coastline, Material is carried out to sea and deposited to form a spit. In the sheltered area behind the spit, a salt marsh will form and 
Many spits have a hooked end caused by a secondary wind. You practice that, practice drawing it, practice saying how it's formed. Right, let's move on now and look at how people are affected by coastal retreats. And as soon as I say that, I'm really hoping that you're thinking of Sean and Yvonne. So we're looking at the impact of coastal retreat on people and property. I'm just going to draw a little picture here for you. So here is your cliff. There's the sea. But remember, it gets very stormy this as well in winter. Here is somebody's house and they have a farm as well. So they've got some sheep. I know you've missed my drawings. They've got a pig. He's very big. And they might have some cows as well. Now the direction of coastal retreat is that way. Remember what I told you at the beginning? The sea will attack the base of the cliff like that. Okay. And eventually that will collapse. As the cliffs retreat this way, you can see what's going to happen to the house. It's going to collapse off the, off the top of the cliff. So, coastal retreat affects people in many ways. Properties can be lost, leading to big insurance claims. Valuable farmland can be lost, leading to loss of income. Often on cliff tops, there are hotels or caravan parks, which may have to be abandoned as they get too close to the cliff edge and that will lead to a loss of income as well. Just try and remember our friends Sean and Yvonne and their little piggies, and that will hopefully get you through a question of that level, okay? Just while we're talking about those questions of that level, remember that in question five, you're gonna have those big six markers or an eight marker with spag. So you're gonna to have to write a more extended piece of writing. Let's think about climate change. It appears in every single topic, doesn't it? And how is that affecting the coastline? But think back to climate and change, the battle for the biosphere, all those topics. What is happening? We've got increasing temperatures and we've got rising sea levels. Now the rising sea levels are actually caused by the rising temperature because the warm ocean expands. It's called the thermal expansion of the oceans and therefore sea levels are rising. We also know that there are more storms and more extreme weather. If you combine a storm plus a high tide, you get what is called a storm surge. And increasingly, there are more of these really strong storms plus a high tide, and they will lead to increasing amounts of coastal flooding, in particular, particularly in areas that are very low lying, yes? Yeah? So increasing sea levels, more flooding. Also, these storms and high tides will lead to increased rates of erosion, which will speed up coastal retreat. Okay, so there's gonna be more erosion. More beaches taken away, which then don't protect the land. That's climate change and how it's going to affect the coastline. Coastland. Now we um, are getting onto something that you are definitely more familiar with now, so I'll be able to go through this a little bit quickly, but perhaps um, coastal management methods. There are two types, aren't there? I'm sure you're thinking of these already. We've got our hard engineering, and two should spring to mind very quickly because we've got our sea walls. Yeah, which deflect the waves away. They're very, very effective. They deflect the waves away, protecting the coastline from erosion and from sea flooding. We have rock armor or riprap, you can call it as well, riprap. These will absorb the wave energy. And finally, we have groins. Watch how you spell that and they stop longshore drift building up a beach. They can be made of wood or they might be also made of rock, like you have in Folkestone. 
So what are the disadvantages? This is what they're going to ask you, the costs and benefits. Well, the disadvantages, they're really expensive. They're ugly and they prevent access to the beach. You only need two or three reasons why they're um, not the best solution. Your advantages though, however, on the other hand, are they're very effective at stopping erosion and at protecting the coast from flooding and they will last a very, very long time. So your investment uh, will be worth it. The only thing is you would only want to do something like this if the area you're protecting behind them is worth it. So often you need to undertake a cost benefit analysis. So our other method of coastal management is soft engineering. These are increasingly preferred. They're much cheaper options um, and they don't look as ugly and they sort of support nature a bit more. So one of these would be, I'm going to let you guess from my amazing picture. There's the little man driving it or a little woman I suppose, who knows. And we've got lots of these on our beach at the moment haven't we? And it's beach replenishment, yes? And by adding shingle, which is the job-free word for pebbles or sand, onto the beach, you form a natural barrier and you will protect the land from erosion. I'm going to put channel on there because that's the name of the ones that come to our coastline. Another thing you can do if you're in an area of dunes or sand dunes, like out at Camber Sands, you can plant this grass called marum grass and it will stabilise dunes and it will stop, stop them blowing away. So that is another option there. Increasingly though, the coasts are being managed by holistic management. Holistic management. And this is a modern approach to coastal management. And it's where you make different decisions about different places along a coastline. So for example, here we have the Warren, we have Folkestone, Hythe, Dimchurch, Dungeness with the power station, the nuclear power station that's there, and over here we've got a place called Ride, not spelt like that, I apologise, that's Ray, it means King in Spanish, Rye. So what we do here is people look at the whole coastline, that's the direction of longshore drift by the way, and they decide to do different things in different places. So for example at the Warren they've decided that managed retreat is the appropriate solution. Same at Rye. So they're allowing a salt marsh to form here and here they're allowing the cliffs to collapse. Folkestone and Hyde, they are holding the line by doing beach replenishment every six months, whereas at Dimchurch, because the area is below sea level, they are going to advance the line and they've built a huge sea defence that involves a big sea wall and lots of rock ones. Dungeness hold the line and there is frequent beach replenishment because they need to protect that power station there. Okay, so this is a holistic modern approach where decisions are made about different sections or zones in what's known as a sediment cell or in one area and those decisions will be made depending on a cost benefit analysis that decides what should be done based on what has been protected. So in the case of Dimchurch, uh, quite popular with tourism, there's lots of holiday parks there, lots of very fertile far farmland out the back here on Romney Marsh and down there, so they decided build a big seawall to protect this area from coastal flooding. So there we go my friends, that is Coasts in a Nutshell.